and welcome back to the Greg Horrendous Show, where we are honored, humbled, and privileged to have the head basketball coach of Princeton University enter the man cave. Mitch Henderson, welcome to the Greg Horrendous Show and WFDU, my man. I love being here, Greg. I tell you what, I, I'm, for those people that know you, it's yeah. hard not to just big smile when, uh, when, when you say that kind of stuff. Because do you remember when we first met a long time ago? Yep. You, you haven't changed much, which is, which is why I love you. So this is, uh, this is a real pleasure to be here. And I, my room, my wife calls it a rate the room. You have excellent stuff going on behind you. So I'm oh, no, I got some. I think it's what was it Feng Shui? Feng Shui. I've I got my jet helmet. I, I've got every everything that um, a man should have in a man cave is yes. down here. And uh, but the most important thing is to have other men appreciate it. <laughs> and I know uh, I know you do. And I, I talked to Kenny um, this morning about how we've been friends, but now the past few weeks of going to the Brick City and donating our time and bringing, uh, you brought Theo this morning, which was the youngest member of the volunteer group. How old is Theo? Is he eight or? He's eight. He's eight. And I brought Trey last, a few weeks ago, and he's 17. And I think that's the only way this thing is going to change, Mitch, is the generations have to get smarter and better and understand that we need to work as one in this world or else it's not going to get better quick. Uh, do you agree with that? Or I do. I do. And I, you know, one of the really cool things that you mentioned about, <clears throat> about going to the rec center is the camaraderie that you get from yeah. being around other people. And, uh, you know, we were driving up today. I have an eight-year-old son, right? So we live in Princeton, and yeah. you know, we, you know, I try to get them, take the kids all over with me. They travel with us to games, and because of that, that I'm sure with Trey too, you try to bring them around, right? Yeah. But um, you know, we we're driving through, and and it was like, it, okay, what are, are those? Where are people living in those apartment buildings? What's that over there? Oh my gosh, you know, it's it's a. Um, there was a place called Steaks and Chess or something like that, right, in Newark, right? So we yep. just had a, a great conversation, and then we were able to, to you know, be near you today. And his highlight, Greg, you should know, was, um, you know, getting – he said, I, I got to stay in there, Coach Greg, you know, like so. – <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there, there's um, – I like it because it's action. It feels like I'm doing something. Right. And right now I can't get my hands on anything, really, and yeah. – um, I'm sure you, you probably feel similarly and oh, yeah. there's a lot of doubt when you're talking to your team, but um, I don't know. We've really tried, I'm sure with your team too, to make action plans. Uh, like what, and the league's been great about that, but our guys have been really good too. And I've been trying to listen to them as much as possible. Mitch, tell our listeners, and, and right now it's a little bit of a, obviously a very different time that we're living in. Um, and usually the show is about, our guests and we'll get to that but I, I think put put our listeners in the minds and uh, of an ivy league student athlete how much different because i think people see and we've played you guys now i think five or six times and it's a privilege for our guys to get on the floor and then come and travel uh to princeton and play but I think our fans and our listeners might be like, wow, these are Princeton guys and he's the Princeton coach. How much of that is reality and how much of it is just these are regular kids? Like how different is the Princeton kid from the Fairleigh Dickinson kid or from the Monmouth kid? Uh, I know that you went to Princeton and you coached at Princeton, so you haven't been to many other universities. You were at Northwestern, but – Tell me about a Princeton kid and his vantage point of what we're going through in this day and age. Well, I, I, maybe this is an unfair place to start, but I'll, I'll, I'll start from a position of when I graduated from Princeton, I got invited to almost every NBA camp. And this was 1998, so it was the year of the lockout. I don't know if you remember this year, but it was – so they ended up 
uh, I ended up doing a few different interviews that year and I met with the Utah Jazz. And one of their concerns about me was that I had gone to Princeton. And it was, uh, I didn't understand the question. The follow-up question was, are you willing to do whatever it takes to make the league? So I think that I understand that question better now. I thought it was completely unfair then. Right. And I would tell you, Greg, that our guys do see themselves as basketball players first that um, have chosen to go to a school where they're, they're, gonna, uh, they're not going to uh, compromise in their goals in terms of what academically and on the court. I would, I would say it's a privilege for us to play against FDU. Everybody on our schedule, we, we love to play. And every single time we get a chance to wear Princeton and take the floor right. against anybody, especially teams in the state of New Jersey, like you, we've had a hard time scheduling local games. You know, I love, I love our game because <laughs> not just because I know you, but because you grease the floors. Uh, we can talk about that later. But uh, I, I, I think that it's, it would be hard for me, Greg, not to say that like, I don't, I, I might bristle a little bit at the fact that you, you know, you're saying that our guys are different. I don't, I, I tell them that they're not. Right. Um, it's, it's always, always about hard work. It's always about putting the time in. I would say though that, um, that at Princeton, Greg, you've got, you've, the, the, in recruiting process, it's, it's imperative that as we look at the transcript and we look at the kid that they line up and that you see a history of doing more and doing extra in the classroom as much as on the court. So, um, those things tend to, to match up and the guys that, that are, that, that, that cut corners early on in their high school careers academically, um, they really struggle and, right. uh, and, and it's not a great fit. So I don't know if that's the, no, the, no, that's a, that's a, a unique way to look at it. And you were actually, I did some research, Mitch. Now you were, part of the Atlanta Hawks, but did you never stepped on the f NBA floor? Tell me how close you got to being an NBA player. Obviously, you made the, the backdoor layup against UCLA, and your teams were incredible. I think you played for three undefeated Ivy League championship teams, but, but were you very, very close to being on, the, on an NBA floor? Tell us you know, your, your, your basketball experience post Princeton. So I, so first I, Jake, Gabe Luellis made the layup. I happened to be oh, on the floor. Got to give, yeah. yeah. And I didn't, and I was, um, wasn't my, you know, that was a, a play called for that specific thing, but I was there and I got to jump up in the air and celebrate right. when, when we right. won. Um, you took credit but, for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I, it's funny, I, you know, I'm sure like you, like I never talk about my time as a player. I never really, you know, I mostly just talk to my teams and, uh, you know, I, I think that's fine. And one of the things about coaching is you get it, you just, you flush all that stuff out of your system. But I will give credit where it's due. You know, Joe Scott, Bill Carmody, John Thompson, C Coach Carrell, Pete Carrell. Oh, yeah. um, I came into a coaching staff that was just so high level. And I had the, the ability and, and maybe the work ethic, but I was just unrecruited. So I got a chance to, to prove myself at a place like Prince. I got a chance to play. And then we were very good. And as you know, that really helps you when you're trying to pursue a professional career. I did step foot. The Hawks, we played a tournament game, inner squad at Georgia Tech. So I never stepped foot on an NBA floor, but I put that uniform on for one game. Wow. Um, and I'll never forget, Lenny Wilkins walked up to me. He was the head coach of the Hawks at the time. And he, and I loved, Coach Curl was so honest, so I loved that. And I was dying to make the team. And everybody was treating me like I was going to be on the team. Mookie Blaylock and Steve Smith and Alan Henderson, Dikembe Mutombo. Wow. They were good. They were like, they were right behind the Bulls and the Hawks, at, or the Bulls and the Pacers. Yeah. They were really good. And um, I knew I was, the writing was on the wall a little bit, but I was, you know, doing my best. I was first in the practice. And he walks up, he goes, hey, we're making cuts today. And you're cut. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was, I, I appreciated it. So I, I it, it was devastating at the time. But again, looking back, I realized that it's, it's such a hard place to make it, Greg. It's so hard to get there. And 
And I was, I, I wasn't a great shooter. And even then that was, the league was going towards being able to make a lot of shots. Right. I think I had um, maybe a, the, the rest of the skill set that you kind of need, but the, you have to be able to make a long shot now more than ever. How about your experience in Ireland? I know you played professionally over there. It's a great, I've run camps over there back in my division two days for years. Uh, how was your experience playing professionally uh, in the great country of Ireland? Yeah, uh, it was amazing. I, and I, you know, I went from, that was the first thing I did. So there was a lockout and I went right into playing in Sligo and I played for the Sligo Dairies. And <laughs> Ireland is, as you know, you know, just about New Jersey, the size of New Jersey. Right. And Western Ireland is where I was, is very different than Eastern Ireland. Yes. And they talk like this out of the side of their mouth and, you know, and sort of growl at you. And uh, it was, it was incredible. People would play drums during the games yeah. One of the coolest things about being there for me, the thing I, I loved, I loved playing, but I was, uh, I taught, I was a teacher and mostly a PE teacher. And they wow. have a sport over there called Gaelic football. Oh yeah. Sure. And basketball. So you'd teach the kids basketball. I would go in there to teach basketball and the little girls that I would teach or the boys, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, they'd be tackling each other and like hitting the ball to each other like this, you know, right. Right. Little Gaelic and basketball. Gaelic's a, a, it's a great game if you give it a chance. Yeah. I loved, I loved my time there. Um, I probably was, like a lot of young kids, wasn't ready to appreciate it the way I would now. Um, I just, a lot had been given to me, and I was, I was basketball I was obsessed with, and I just wasn't balanced enough maybe to see what, what I was really there for, which is to learn from the people. And they're great people in Ireland. For Love sure. best. Mitch, you were drafted by the New York Yankees. I mean, come on, dude. You got to get this out. I'm yeah. finding all of this out, doing research. You were a pitcher. What was your – why – and, again, we're talking about what you didn't do, but what you've done is incredible. But why – what kept you from being a professional or a major league pitcher uh was it the speed of your fastball your curveball what what was your strength as a, a baseball player yeah. uh, in college and growing up you know I played I played high school baseball in Indiana and I was you know back then you played you know you I was the best hitter and pitched right. and played center field and I always thought my path was playing center field and I was probably a better I probably had a better trajectory as a baseball player than, than basketball. But I remember the draft is in June. In the 94 draft, I got drafted by the Yankees in the mid-20s, you know, which surprised me a little higher than I had expected. Um, and uh, I got the, the – I'll never forget this, like, gruff New York. And at the time, I'd never been to the East Coast, Greg. I had never seen the New Jersey Turnpike. I didn't know anything about New Jersey. Now I'm sure. – Registered voter, proud New Jersey person, right? Like native yeah. New Jerseyan. Yeah. But I, I was, um, the guy was like, you know, well, you know, uh, hey, Mitch, we've decided that we drafted you. What are your plans? Well, I got accepted to Princeton. And before I could say another word, he goes, go to Princeton. Click. <laughs> Hung up the phone. <laughs> so I never, right, I, I think that was probably a good thing. Because I, I would, I would have considered anything. Like I loved baseball. I would have gone. Uh, my, I was a knucklehead. I would have, I would have loved to have tried out uh, yeah. minor league baseball. I would, have, I would have loved that. But that guy did me a favor, I think, and it was the right call. I wasn't good enough. People that know college basketball know Vincennes, Indiana, for one reason and one reason only, and that's Vincennes Junior College, especially yeah. back in the day. I mean, that that still is a great junior college, and it's got. The history. Uh, well, tell us about what Vincennes, Indiana yeah. is all about, man. I've been I've there once. I leave it to you for the Greg Herrera show. I, unbelievable. I, right now, I wish I could curse because I, I want to like, you know, I am so impressed you pulled that out. I've never been asked this question. Yeah. It is the single most, uh, outside of my parents, yeah. the Dan Sparks basketball camp. Yeah. I know you're, if, if no one's seen you do a basketball camp, they haven't lived. Yes. But there were about 
50 Greg Horrendous at this camp <laughs> that were coaches. And it was the best thing. And I can tell you, like, we had this, the stations were yeah. each 30 minutes long. Uh, it was incredible, jam packed. I mean, you kids from all over the country would go to this camp. Sure. And, you know, back in the day, so I don't know if you remember, but uh, the guy played at Notre Dame. His last name was Rivers. He's a really good player. Oh, David, Rivers. David Rivers. Played, played uh, junior college at Vincennes. We had terrific players. This guy named Ed Loudon, who was a great lefty shooter. Ruben Tisdale, great dunker. All these guys have gone to, to have terrific college basketball careers. But Dan Sparks ran this great camp. And I can remember, like, cutthroat. We played, you know, three on three. You, play, you just learned how to play. Right. Um, it was, I, you know, I, I was a multi-sport athlete. But it was an education, even just to how you sat down. You know, how you listened, uh, and I've heard you give speeches and the way you give your cadence, it always reminds me, I always look at you as like those, and they were largely run by high school coaches. And right. so everybody always says that the high school coaches were, and yet a basketball is great, it's because of the coaches. The passion right. and the fan base, most of the high schools were, were the biggest attraction in all of those towns. Mitch. You know, Coach Carrill, really, I mean, one of the – Mount Rushmore, you know, he's got to be up there. I mean, obviously you have – you know, you go back to, you know, Fog Allen and Iba. And, but if you're a Jersey kid and you're an Ivy League and you've studied the game, uh, people just look at Coach Carrill uh, – as an icon, I just need one nugget. I need a story about him on a bus or in a practice or something that you can share with our listeners uh, about coach during your recruiting process or something that you can give us the inside look at uh, coach Pete Carrell. What do you got for well, me? I, 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 you're, to pick the right one. It's like, I, I feel like a comedian because I, I, which joke is going to land the best? But um, I'll, if I, I get, I get two. So first, um, he, I, I, we, we played a game where I had a ton of turnovers, and he, after the game was over, he goes, how you know, you, how many did you have? Two I'm, or I'm three? A lot, a lot. I'm not going to go to my team teases me. It's in the record book, but way too many. And I was just so embarrassed. And he launched into this speech, and he had a way of getting to the point for a great punchline. And he said, you know, I'm going to come, Mitch, and then long pause, I'm going to come to one of your baseball games and I'm going to watch you pitch. But you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my mitt and I'm going to stand behind the cage because you're going to be throwing the ball all over the place and I'll be catching the ball all night, you know. So it's this long story. The second story was he had, he, he was a truth teller. He could be very difficult to the point of, you know, he stepped over the line. Um, and and I'll, as a head coach, he was at all of my practices for my first few years. And I was at first inti intimidated by him, but also I wanted to, you know, you want to have the success that he has. He saw so much, but I also wanted to please him. And I think the best piece of advice he gave me was to be yourself. Uh, you, got, you gotta be you, don't be me. But the last piece is we had a player, his name was Hans, and uh, he was a freshman. He wasn't great, and he, got, he wasn't playing, and he went down the lane, and he shot the ball from about nine feet like a runner, and it, and it went right up in the air, and it came straight down, and it didn't touch the rim. So he goes back, and he goes, Hans, did you work on your shooting over the summer? And before Hans could answer, he launched into the one-sided conversation between Hans and Hans' dad. So he played both sides of the conversation. Hansworth, your breakfast is ready. Did you shoot your shots today, son? Yes, father. <laughs> My, you did. You know, it was like playing both. Oh, like it, it was like yeah. everybody was laughing. So, you know, as hard as he was, he also had this almost, almost um, big time uh, comedic, comedic presence sure, sure. that allowed him to get away with some of the other things that he said. Does that make sense? Total sense. And I think, 
that generation that I played for, that was all part of it, that they would get on you and kind of make light of the situation and use humor in, in coaching. Yes. And I think quite honestly, I know I do it. I mean, I tell our players all the time, like one of my lines is like, don't be a robot, man. Don't bore me. Give me some, like, you know, the, the game is, it, the, it's a game played by people, you know, yes. and the characters of the game, uh, but not only is Coach Carrillo one of the great ones, he's a character as well. And he's yeah. confident in himself so he can go places where other people are afraid, afraid to go. Well, I, I was going to ask you, so sorry to interrupt you, but like, so yeah. I thought one of the great things that Coach Carrillo did is you knew – what he was about from the very beginning. He would sort right. of, he, he showed you his personality. And I think you do that. You told me this great story about practice starts. Maybe, have you shared this with your, yes. what, what, what's the song? They know, Rosalita. When, Rosalita, right? So yeah. there's some personality to that. And coach, coach was like that too. I would imagine that that's a big part of it too. I think as, as teachers and coaches, like, you know, you've got to make, you've got to be vulnerable. You got to be vulnerable and you have to have a presence right now, Mitch, the, the clock is ticking, but okay. us as basketball coaches and basketball players, we need to have a presence in this world. And I, I just think, you know, at Fairleigh Dickinson, it's a very diverse university, a global university as is Princeton. And I think our players right now and you and I as coaches need to step up um, and show the world that there are a lot of good things going on in this world as far as racial discrimination is going on. People are doing good things, and it's, it's time for us to really step up and shine. And I think, uh, you know, by you and I going into Newark, on, you know, it's not easy getting from Princeton to Newark at 8.30 on a Wednesday morning, but we need to do that. I mean, and uh, does that make sense to you, Mitch? Uh -huh. Absolutely, and that's an, that's the most fun I have all week. I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, a lot of it because of you're there. Um, and I sense that we can lean on each other, not just me and you, but in particular me and you, um, to help. And I don't, you know, I'm not sure why we weren't, we weren't doing this before, but now is the time for us to talk to each other about what our players are saying to us ways in which we how are we listening how are we improving uh yeah. and uh and then what's our again what's our action plan what are we doing in our communities and i had this talk with with um i got a chance to visit with steve kerr and he said that one of the initiatives that they're having in in the nba is to take care of your backyard and uh and, and right. take, you know uh, take care of your home first so uh that's been a big part of uh you know, us in Trenton, us in our involvement in Newark. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at, as we get a little bit more involved here in the area. No, no question. And I think, I, I don't know, man, and I don't want to brag, but I think college basketball gets a bad rap, but we've been doing a lot of good things in our backyard. You know, like, and, and, and to speak for FDU, we've been going into the Boys and Girls Club and the 21 and over and going into schools and, and, and just reaching out. And when everyone was putting their statement out, my statement was that we live our statement. You know, we, we, every day, you know, you live it as opposed to just stating some philosophical uh, retort. So it's, yeah. uh, I, I just think guys like you, man, that, you know, we were asked to do it once and now, you know, we're addicted to this. And I yeah. think we're addicted to the game and, and helping people and I can't thank you enough Mitch for uh being a friend being a col colleague and now being my Brick City teammate uh yeah. good man well I feel the feeling is mutual and I, I feel that um you know I, I sort of feel like sometimes you feel really connected to certain coaches it's good it's not an easy profession and yeah. um, you did you've done you remember a couple of years ago, we, we were having a tough year. You had a terrific team, and you guys beat us at Jadwin. And 
you know, I was, I was down and instantly you showed me how to behave by telling me, Hey, you're going to be okay. And then you sent me a message after the game. So you're a class act and uh, you got a lot of coaches out there that follow your lead. So it's an honor to be here joining you in the man cave, Greg. <laughs> appreciate being involved. Hey, you, once this social distancing's over, man, you can come right here. Oh. Uh, you, you and Theo and me and Trey will hang I'm out. Watching, on it. We'll watch some on it. We'll see you in Brick City here again soon. I'll see you on Wednesday, brother. Thanks, Mitch. Okay.